Hi there. In our lecture today, we're going to talk about China, its unique geography, and how that has impacted the culture and the people who live there. To begin with, when we look at China on the other side of the globe, it is uh, an extraordinarily large territory surrounded by much smaller countries in many cases uh, in fairly remote and difficult to access areas. It's sort of cordoned off in a lot of ways. Uh, we see in the south, uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, Burma, Nepal, all um, mountainous jungle area that uh, is sort of linked with China through the Mekong River. And then across Nepal, we have the Himalaya, which are the tallest mountains in the world, uh, which really separates China with India. And Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Russia, in the uh, far eastern Russia, Siberia, all these are fairly remote regions that are sparsely populated. And the Koreas and Japan, some of their nearest neighbors, all had uh, influence on and have been influenced by China to an extraordinary degree. China and India are always been very long time trading partners uh, and an exchange of ideas between these two powerful economies has played a pivotal role in defining um, Asian culture. If we look at the size of China, you'll see that it really sort of fits within the continental United States. Uh, it has uh, a fairly broad territory that, just like the United States, covers about what would be about four time zones. That said, in China, there is only one time zone. And I'll explain that 90 percent of the population is in the western, sorry, the eastern portion around um, Beijing. And so there is just one time zone, Beijing time. In China, the population is extraordinarily dense. Even though they have a similar size to the United States, they have over a billion people more than we do. It's hard to put that into perspective. In China, there are about 375 people per square mile. And that's if you were to spread out the population over the entire territory. In the US, <clears throat> that same estimate is only 92 people per square mile. So you can see the density of Chinese population is quite extraordinary. China has over 160 cities that have a population over 1 million. The city of Shanghai has a 22 million people. The US has 10 cities over 1 million. And New York City, their largest city, is not even half as big at 8.5 million people. As I was mentioning, within China, the population and the main population centers are really sort of separated and isolated from other cultures and other countries. So there's a, a very strong density of what we call Han Chinese. The Gobi Desert, across which uh, the trade route, which goes in, uh, and leads to the Middle East and the Mediterranean, uh, is a difficult and arduous journey across that desert. The Himalayan mountains also are impassable. And the ocean voyage across through Southeast Asia can also be rather treacherous. So a lot of the population that we have talked to really reside in a region called Inner China. This is where most of the people will live. There is this sort of fertile region called the Gansu Corridor, which goes into the interior a little further, a sort of extended finger that reaches out from there. And that is part a very rich, fertile area that has been fed by two major rivers, the Yangtze and the Yellow River. The lowest plateau in the 
western region of inner China is a portion of very fertile soft sandstone, which played a very important role in providing a rich fertile land as these rivers uh, provided the kind of social stability and the, the, the possibility of rich settlements of people. Within China, there are many different kinds of populations. The largest and most numerous population are the Han Chinese. Further north, you have Korean and Japanese. And then uh, sort of the to the outer China in the western regions, we have Mongolian <clears throat> and the sparsely populated Tibetan, Uyghur, and Kazakh region. The Uyghur region has been in the news quite a bit. These are predominantly Muslim people who have been under subjugation by the Chinese government. In a similar manner, the Tibetan people have also uh, were, their territory was annexed by China uh, when the Communist Party took over. And they also have been fighting for their own independence. Language groups in China are remarkably varied. Uh, even within the, the densely populated region, you can see at least a dozen different languages. There's the sort of northern Mandarin, various dialects of that, and then in the south, the various uh, dialects of Cantonese uh, can be found. These are distinctly different languages that are almost unintelligible to people from one region to another. What has unified China for so long is not that they speak the same language, but everyone in China writes the same language. And we'll talk more about the history of how the written languages became unified. So even though people say and sound words differently, the characters they write uh, are identical. So whether you're writing the word mountain in Mandarin, or Cantonese, it looks the same, even though they will pronounce these words differently because the characters represent ideas. They do not necessarily represent sounds. This has changed some in recent years, but the ideograms are a kind of foundational character to the Chinese language. One of the challenges we have in studying Chinese uh, art and is that you'll often encounter Chinese words with various spellings. The older version of Romanizing Chinese characters was called Wade Giles. And so you'll often see words like Peking, Hsien, and Hong Kong. All of these are Romanizations of Chinese names that were part of what were commonly used in in uh, outside of China to sort of describe and, and explain Chinese characters. Then in the 1970s, uh, China adopted its own system called the Pinyin system of romanization. And many of these names have changed. So we no longer say Peking, we say Beijing. Instead of Xi'an, we say Xi'an. And, but we, in some cases, we still hold on to the Wade Giles. You'll still see Hong Kong instead of Xiangang, okay? So it does create confusion. There are actually five different systems of uh, Chinese romanization. And so spelling can be a problem. I do my best to regularize the spelling, but uh, my apologies if there's any confusion about this uh, while we are on this topic. One of the things we see in the earliest signs of Chinese civilization is a very remarkable uh, and unique system of tool making, the leveloi tools, uh, which are different than other kinds of stone tools we see elsewhere in the world. A lot of the technologies that China develops, uh, while they have uh, parallel technologies elsewhere in the world, they approach them differently. It's as if they really have found a very unique and novel way to solve the sort of basic problems of civilization. In these tools, what makes them different from other standard flake tools 
is that instead of making uh, a stone flake tool flaking off the excess, the flakes themselves become the tools. So that instead of <clears throat> using one stone to make one tool, you can make many tools from a single stone. These were found in South China between 160 and 170,000 years old. <clears throat> Let's get a, a quick overview of Chinese history. The first sort of written history we have of China dates back to the Shang Dynasty, about 1200 BCE. And there we start to see a system of writing, a system of government, and legends and stories which indicate that China has now really been uh, around for several thousand years prior to this dynasty. And only now are we just beginning to find archaeological evidence to support that. We don't have any written evidence. We definitely see signs that there has been a kind of continuity of Chinese cultural ideas dating back very far into antiquity. China as a great powerful kingdom really emerges in the Shang Dynasty with the start uh, in, in the uh, development of, of silk and no one knows exactly when this happened but this new material using the threads of the silkworm cocoon and weaving it into this super strong durable material. Uh, this is a picture of silk gloves that are 2,000 years old and they, you still see the color and the dyes and the threads. You could still wear those and they will keep you warm. There are very few fabrics in the world that are as durable as silk. And this became a highly prized textile that China had exclusive control over through its early history. Silk and other innovations early on launched China into a, a cultural and uh, economic powerhouse that dominates the world for thousands of years. China had the invention of paper and the invention of printmaking centuries before these inventions would be used widely in Europe. And with these uh, innovations, they were able to develop an enormous bureaucracy and a stable government that created um, an incredible economic uh, strength. So there are periods of disunion and disillusion within China, but the cultural focus has always been on stability and order. And we'll talk more about how that was developed within the society. But having these innovations were incredible tools that allowed them a kind of exclusive access to them. And just as silk was starting to appear elsewhere in the world and they no longer quite had a monopoly on silk, they developed yet another highly prized item for trade, the development of porcelain. And again, this would take another 500 years before anyone in the West could figure out how the Chinese made porcelain. It was an extremely complex chemical firing uh, process that required uh, very advanced chemistry. And so we'll see in the history of China that they remain for the vast majority of their history 500 to 800 years ahead of everyone else. I can show you this very strikingly in a comparison of these two ships. This is one of the 67 uh, giant treasure boats that were commanded by the eunuch Chenghe from the Ming Dynasty. He was also known as Ma San Bao. He commanded this vast fleet, not only of these 67 giant vessels that were over 300 feet long and about three to 400 smaller vessels and uh, scientific craft and military craft, this giant armada which sailed from China as far away as the Middle East and Africa. And we have some historic record of this. But a lot of what this voyage created would eventually be destroyed by subsequent emperors who found this sort of 
marching around the world and parading their power as ostentatious and, and useless. The smaller boat you see on this picture is uh, the Santa Maria, which was the, um, uh, the, one of the vessels of Christopher Columbus used to discover the New World, which was 100 years later than China's development. So Christopher Columbus's boats were some of the more advanced sailing ships in Europe at this time. And you see how it's just dwarfed by the incredible economic power and wealth of China. Unfortunately, the treasure fleet of China is uh, a historic anomaly that would lead to absolutely no long-term gains for China. Whereas <clears throat> this small vessel commanded by Christopher Columbus would dramatically and radically change the trajectory of Europe and allow it to begin to exploit its wealth and power all over the world and eventually eclipse China. We'll talk more about that as from the Ming Dynasty, China reaches its peak and in its long, slow decline through the Qing Dynasty, eventually coming into the late 19th and 20th centuries, it is in utter ruin and is only now coming into its own. It is estimated that China will become the world's largest economy in a mere five years, five to 10 years, depending on how things pan out. That will eclipse the United States for the first time in a century, more than two centuries. So modern China today, religious practices are rare. Most people, 60%, almost 60%, are non-religious, and 33% then follow some kind of uh, indigenous local uh, traditions, uh, ancestor worship based on Taoism and Confucianism. Uh, Buddhists are a mere 6%, Taoists, Confucianists. Uh, and then there's a fairly small uh, but recognizable uh, Islamic population in the eastern, sorry, western portion of the country. China today is an autocratic government that is tightly controlled by the central communist party. Everything comes through them. It is a country of great secrecy. It is a country of where there's very little that we know for certain. Um, a lot of people who are dissidents may suddenly disappear. People who oppose the government or are critical of the government uh, can be punished very brutally. We know that China has the largest population of executions anywhere in the world. We don't know the exact number, but um, the estimate is somewhere over a thousand every year are put to death for crimes as various as corruption and tax evasion. So in this way, we know that China's have, a, a, you know, a, a very strong centralized government that the people um, have followed. One of the challenges that China faces with its uh, dramatic march toward industrialization is that you know, there has been a very stark rise in pollution. China is one of the worst polluters in the world. Uh, and it is one that continues to uh, put out an enormous amount of fine particulate coal matter. Coal burning is still very widely used in the country. That said, in the last five to 10 years, there have been uh, dramatic uh, reductions in the pollution in China, probably more dramatic than anywhere else in the world. They've reduced their uh, carbon emissions by 30% in the last five years. And so the death toll in China from pollution is still staggering, but it also shows that they have, because it's a centralized government and the biggest polluters were largely government-run industry, they were able to dramatically turn around and reduce their needs uh, for coal 
as you can see from this chart here, um, the very unhealthy regions of China are still very dramatic in many parts of the country. So here's a review quiz. These are just questions that you should be able to answer and it's a chance for you to think about what we've just talked about. What are some of the important countries nearby China? What are some of the significant geographic features of China? How are languages and cultures distributed inside China? What are some of the notable achievements in China's history? Lastly, what are kinds of challenges that China faces today?